And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Joe Molina, founding director of Emergent Mission. Joe has over 35 years of consulting experience. And in 2017, he made the decision to work solely with religious institutions and mission-driven nonprofits that were committed to making a difference in the personal, professional, and spiritual lives of those they serve. That sounds like Western Massachusetts. Joe has an MA in Practical Theology from Graduate Theological Union, where he learned to integrate theology and theological practices with business theory and proven best practices. At GTU, he began to develop programming that would serve faith communities and become emergent mission. Joe has provided stewardship consultation to Episcopal congregations and dioceses, and we are happy to have him here this evening. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Bishop. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Is it time for the PowerPoint? We're good? All right, let me, let me share my screen. Fantastic. And let me get us in slideshow mode. Can everybody see that okay? Good, we've got a thumbs up. So I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I'm glad that the Bishop, um, Bishop Fisher uh, referenced um, our call to be stewards as people of faith and part of our Christian commitments. Um, stewardship is a term that we use a lot in the church. And it's a term that I think um, in some ways has been misappropriated and um, has made itself somewhat limited in terms of the pure ethos of the term stewardship. And we're going to get into that and talk about it. Now, in this session, um, there's a couple things I want to share. Number one, this is really about just for us to explore your own mindset, your own understanding or perception of stewardship. Um, it's tough in 40 minutes to kind of show you a lot of living examples of what I've done um, in campus ministry or camp and conference center or in a parish uh, or cathedral environment or even things I've done at ECF when I was a capital campaign consultant there. Um, but as you all probably know, we can't change our behavior until we change the way we think or either supplement it, right? Because we're all on kind of a spectrum in terms of what we understand of terminology. And so today I want to kind of reclaim stewardship, get us back to the, the biblical revelation of our call to be stewards. And I wanna focus on the interpersonal aspects of what it means to be a steward, right? There are congregational development and vitality elements to this, there's formative elements to this, and on the backside, there always are fundraising um, and financing and funding um, benefits from it. So um, the Bishop did a pretty good job of um, kind of giving you my synopsis. So let's just kind of move on. I do have, program offerings for young adult and campus ministry, for Episcopal church and conference centers, a new relationships in March with the National Association of Episcopal Schools. And so all those are emerging, um, some more advanced than others. And um, my expertise has always been in stewardship, um, primarily in the context of relationship development, in interpersonal engagement, in advocacy building, capacity building, and ultimately in using all those to get us the funds we need to deal with all the functional things, uh, regardless of what type of faith community we have. So on that note, um, there's only gonna be two cases where I need some type of formal response and you can use the chat room, Vicki's standing by. If um, Zoom is such a wonderful, or video conference is such a wonderful tool. I remember when it was in its, its, its infancy and it was, you had propri proprietary systems that didn't work well. And now we all have access to Zoom and, and complimentary video conferencing tools you can use on a Mac or a PC. The frustrating part can be, since I'm such a relational guy and love being around people, is I'm not with you, right? We're not in chairs and I'm standing and walking around you and we're making eye contact and smiling or somebody's kind of looking off in the distance and I might ask you what you're pondering. Um, so right now I'm looking at slides and I can't even see any of you except for Vicky right now and one or two other folks uh, in this shortened version of, of um, gallery mode. Um, if um, I would like you, instead of waiting till the end to ask a question, if something resonates with you and you have a question, raise your hand, type something in the chat box, or just hit the uh, raised hand um, 
uh, function within Zoom, okay? Um, that way it'll be a little more interactive and we can get your questions answered more immediately, which might benefit other people as well. So this question of when I ask you what comes to mind when you think of the word stewardship, I want you to just think of the gut reaction that you normally would get and type that in the chat box. And then Vicki will be kind enough to report those out as they come in. Pledging and committing funds. Thank you. Asking for money. Totally. <laughs> Taking good care of what we've been given. Thank you. Fundraising. Giving. Oh, crap, it's that time of year again. Thank you for that honest reply. Okay. <laughs> generous, resp generous response to God's abundant grace. There we go. Yep. Nurturing, caretaking, giving and pledging. Why do we give? Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. So a lot of that was about money. And some of that was also about kind of our own call to mission, what it means to give, right? And I'd say what it means to give as a reflection of your own personal experience of the meaning of faith, you know, and maybe your personal relationship with God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to so say the Trinity. I've heard somebody, some people say there are, there are God people and there are Jesus people. Um, but the reality is, is that, um, we live in a world where um, money is a part of our life, right? And if we think about stewardship just as fundraising, we tend to approach stewardship as, let me see if I can get this right without a total paraphrase. Oh crap, it's that time of year again, right? So, um, which is uncomfortable for the person who asks and the person who is being asked, right? Even though it comes every year, we should be expecting it. So we're going to explore why that that uh, emotion comes up on both sides of the equation for the person to be asked and the person asking. OK, so normally when we look at stewardship. I'm going to reduce the screen even further so I can get the full slide We're we're normally looking at stewardship as funding. It's funding the operations of the church. Right. We look at annual appeals. Right. That happens every time of year. So that's a recurring event. Sometimes we call it pledge season, do we not? Or stewardship season. We have capital campaigns, which happen episodically, depending on deferred maintenance and what we need or enhancements we want to make to a campus or a church. We have plan giving, which should be happening most of the time, but usually can be more ad hoc or event driven to either um, feed or seed an endowment or an additional endowment, special projects, sending the kids to Canterbury or, oh, you know, we need another freezer for the food pantry, those types of things. Um, and then major gifts are those things that we don't normally talk about in the parish environment, um, but we would definitely in a capital campaign, right? And so ultimately, th these are all fundraising initiatives. But in our lexicon, when we think about stewardship, we always tend to just even minimize it and limit it just to be annual appeals. And I've, and you know, in my own parish, St. Michael and All Angels in Albuquerque, even though I was born and raised in the Philly area, and that's where I am right now. So I'm no longer in New Mexico, even though St. Michael's, Michael's will still be considered my home parish for a very long time. Um, even in my own parish, um, our clergy had a tendency to just view what we were doing in stewardship as annual appeals. And, this, and the, our committee would say that I chaired would be, well, we should be talking to finance. We should be talking to um, the building and grounds committee. Right, we should be talking to our ministries because they do need money, and it's our responsibility to fill these buckets, right? And so those institutional needs are what these are supposed to actually address. And then, what are our sources? Our sources are parishioners. I'm going to use the word constituents in a little bit. That neutralizes it. It makes it more open because in campus ministry we talk about constituents, not just students. And then we do the same thing in camps and conference centers and schools, et cetera. So we try to broaden, you know, who are the people that we serve, right, categorically and what are their needs and what do we bring to bear in terms of programming to address those needs that builds really strong relationships. But we might look at philanthropic sources, right, the lilies and the trinities of the world, as well as grants, events, you know, even the diocese, right, 
And so let me do this sometimes. There we go. And so how we define stewardship really creates a perception around that, right? So you can see here with me just talking extemporaneously over this, it's kind of this iterative cycle of the word stewardship and our attachment to money and funding tends to shape our perception around stewardship. It alters our mindset. In fact, almost kind of cements a mindset, which then affects our behavior, right? Which includes any anxiety around asking for money. And then all of which define our experiences of positive or negative or somewhere in between, right? And the cycle really just continues until we choose to break it. So words create limitations, but in our case, there's tremendous possibilities. And so what we need to consider is what's our starting point when we think of the word stewardship? Are we just wanting to raise money? We know it's a practical necessity. It's not even a need. We have to have it, right? Um, or do we have a more expansive vision? And so this is where I want to interject the asking for money in the funding aspect. It's almost like when someone gives, it's almost like a line item budget, right? In their household. Like I have my auto payment, my rent or my mortgage payment, my utilities, my cell phone payment, internet payment, et cetera, food. And then I also, um, sorry about that. That's my phone. I thought I had it on vibrate. Um, and then we look at stewardship is what am I going to give to my church? How much can I afford this year? Right. And so the other option of that would be the transformational aspect of stewardship. And we'll get into that in a second. And I'm going to move one second here. Turn this on. All right. Pardon me for that. So when we move in the transactional world, stewardship tends to look like a pledge card, right? And this would be a letter from the rector or maybe um, a senior warden, rector's warden, whomever. Here's St. Michael's website. Here's the Facebook page. There's always a donate button. There's a QR code that kind of makes a little bit of sex appeal. It means we're hip, right? Young people like that. We might even give a proportional giving table. We may not ask for 10 or 20% more this year if we're running a little bit of a deficit or we're having additional expenses, but it's almost like when I go to buy a sandwich or, or a coffee and up comes, how much am I going to tip, right? Same thing here. It's helpful, but it's transactional. And then we do things like annual fundraisers or silent auctions or special events or my parish, you know, we're trying to sell burritos all the time and other things for our, our day school and other events that we have. We rent space um, and uh, we also might have alumni events, common in campus ministry, in, in Episcopal schools, et cetera, maybe not so much in a parish environment. Okay. So these all have a purpose right? Functional things are good, right? They can live in the same world. They're not mutually exclusive. But if you're just relying on these methods to actually help you raise the funds you need in whatever buckets we need to fill, then we could be in a precarious position, right? People are expecting this, right? And so the transactional approach very much can be an approach that promotes disconnection, so we focus on raising money. You know, these are not woven into the fabric of your parish ministry. Um, they're unidirectional asks for financial support. We make assumptions, a lot of times incorrect assumptions about parishioners and that they will provide support. You can kind of tell from looking at an annual giving list out of your out of your, you know, uh, church management system who gives, you know, it's kind of nice to see where things are tracking upwards or downwards or static. I will tell you, I've looked at enough annual reporting and looked at pledging to see that when pledge are going down, I can almost predict that someone's going to leave the parish and there's probably a pastoral opportunity to engage that person because something is going on in their life that they're disconnecting from the parish itself right? You see them less on Sunday services, less active in ministry, et cetera. Um, we make an assumption that the needs of the institutions and constituents are aligned. And we tend to focus on the institution's need rather than the constituents. I do a lot of congregational conversations. Um, 
I'm a relational guy and I just love to talk to people and understand their own faith journey, where they are in their faith journey, their aspirations as a person of faith, the challenges they run into every day and you know how a particular faith community, the one they're most involved in uh, that I might or might not be, um, supports them in their faith journey, nurtures their experience of faith and their experience of God. And I've talked to a lot of people that sing in the choir, you know, that, that, um, read, um, um, read, um, the, uh, the lectionary on a Sunday that are, you know, in, um, that are musicians in the parish that have smiles on their face, but when you actually talk to them, their heart is breaking. And so I often wonder how many people that you see on a given day, and let's just talk about your faith community and not just the world, okay? Um, would really like to be spoken to and really like to have a more in-depth conversation. Okay, Now, I'm assuming since we have clergy on this call and lay leaders that there are some pastoral skill sets, right, that you can bring to bear. The average parishioner would be scared to death to ask something in case, you know, there was kind of a deep need and a deep case, sense of suffering. And one of the worst things you could do is not know how to respond, right, or, or say the wrong thing. So there's a lot of apprehension. I also want to share that um, giving may feel like an obligation to the one who's being asked. We've already established that and may feel like a burden to the one who is asking. And I already mentioned that the donor decision-making is typically cognitive, right? So let's shift this. Why do people really give? Well, they give when your faith community, your institution speaks to what is most important to them as reflecting in their deepest needs and desire for change. As people... We're in one place. We always want to get together. We were born with a desire for forward movement, right? I'd even contest that people that just want to stay the same really are resisting change so they don't lose any momentum, right? And people give when they can connect how your capacity to affect change, how you nurture their faith experience impacts their lives in the day-to-day. -day. I often wonder why someone would pass four Episcopal churches to go to your parish. When I was in Albuquerque, we had people yeah, that could be 10, 15 miles away, and there were a significant amount of Episcopal churches. I'm in downtown Philly. There's about 10 Episcopal churches right now from the Delaware River to the Schuylkill River, which is 20 blocks, and then north and south, about 10 blocks. There's one a, a block and a half out my front door. There's another one floor by, four blocks west of that and another one three blocks west of that one on the east side another four blocks from me it's um but the question is is why do you choose to go to a specific church and i will give preaching its due right and i'll give the personality of clergy their due um or maybe even the nature of the congregation itself right of the laity but there's something deeper in there and I, I, I use the metaphor of when I was in my homiletic class, but so much my, my Hebrew scriptures class at CDSP, um, my professor would say to me like, Joe, uh, he would only give me a B, which drove me crazy. But it was because he said, I need you to go deeper. You need to go deeper. You're reading the surface and you're reporting on the surface of what you see in the scripture. You know, there are life meanings in here. There's a lot of depth and theological depth that I need you to unveil and then make practical connections in the day-to-day -day lives of people, okay? So when we do that, people will see a value of being spiritually and emotionally invested in your faith community as the pure reflection of their faith. So this transformational approach looks at stewardship theologically as a call to mission, It's the call to be in relationship and the call to be pastoral by nature. So in the call to mission, it's what is calling, how is God calling me to serve my fellow man or serve humanity in the context of my faith? And the call to relationship is I am called to be in relationship, not in isolation. And pastorally speaking, I'm called to be nurturing, empathetic, and compassionate. 
we can call that soul care. And I know that the diocese has an emphasis on creation care as well. And in many ways, this begs the question, what are the needs of the people that sit in our pews? What are the things that are most important to them? Do we really know or are we making assumptions? Because when we find that out and they can make those connections, think of it as a ministry of connection making or a ministry of connections, then the financial support we're looking for, the volunteerism, right? The sharing of God-given gifts, which we normally would say time, talent, and treasure will feed those institutional needs. But paradoxically speaking, in the context of faith, which is purely par paradoxical, we're playing in here. Let me engage you. Let me find out what's going on in your world. What's important to you? Where do you want to go? What's getting in the way? And how can we help? Purely in the context of your experience of faith. Any questions, concerns, comments before I move forward? Got a lot of chat stuff going on that I can't read. So Vicki, is anything standing out to you? Nothing new in the chat and I'm looking for hands. Okay, perfect. We're going to keep on moving then. All right, now compare this to that. <laughs> Other than the the colors, right? This is pretty functional, has a place. This is more transformational because it focuses on experience. Okay, so I, I wanna do a reflection for you. And um, I would encourage you to just, um, rather than put this in the chat, maybe if one or two of you could raise a hand and share. So I want you to think about a faith community for which you felt or feel a deep connection and appreciation and enthusiasm. And I want you to kind of reflect upon your experience of that. And did it meet a deep need or hunger? And what was its impact in your life? And how did it manifest in your experience of God? You can say your relationship with God. And how did it manifest in your own way you viewed yourself, your relationship with yourself? And how might it have manifested in your relationship with others or how you even see your place in the world in relationship with the world? And this may or may not apply to you, but I know for me, it, my experience was one that was a seminal moment that became really clear for me that, the, uh, that something I was looking for for a very long time, and that was the meaning of faith and its impact in my life. So I will share with you my personal story, and that is raised Roman Catholic in suburban Philadelphia, Catholic grade school, big Catholic high school. And by the time I was 18 and graduated, um, my parents said I didn't need to go to church anymore, and I was so happy that I didn't need to. Um, I didn't have a bad Roman Catholic experience. In fact, in all fairness to the nuns and the priest and, and the lay teachers that tried to teach me or form me, I just didn't even think I knew the, the kind of questions to ask. But I knew I didn't like top-down structures. I knew the ritual was annoying to me because nobody explained the ritual. Nobody explained the liturgy to me. And I really struggle, and I always have in business with, with phraseology. Jesus died for my sins, God loves you, et cetera, God's grace. Nobody ever unpacked it for me. And so for 30 years, I knew there was something about faith. I was an altar boy, I was a choir boy. So, um, but it just didn't make sense until I got to St. Michael and All Angels and that was kind of a circuitous route, right? But I found that place on you know May 17th of 2009. And from the moment I walked into that narthex and I heard the Collect of Purity, I, I was just taken in. The Collect, the Collect of Purity for me is I walk into church and God knows everything to there is to know about Joe Merlino. And Joe Merlino just needs to sit there and have a conversation with God through the liturgy. 
I can't put any air on any airs. I can't be delusional, right? God's very clear about who I am and why I'm here and what God wants to do for me if I let God do for me. And then there's Eucharist, form C of the Eucharistic prayer, which for me was about creationism meets evolutionism. And God was responsible for evolution. How nice is that? Right? So beautifully written as well. And then there's a post-communion prayer, which says you've just been fortified in the body and blood of Christ. Now you have a responsibility to go out there and be kind, lead by example, live the gospel Monday through Saturday, which is a difficult time to do it. And then I immediately got involved, was invited into a congregational vitality initiative. We called it development back then using the industrial areas foundation model. I led that core team and um, that team of folks just went in one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, our ASA back then was probably 350. Um, so we had about 400 people. We engaged about 250, 275 over three or four months to find out what was most important with our parishioners and what we might need to do to change the way we actually engaged our faith community, changed our ministries, launched new ministry, changed the worship services a little bit based on the needs of our parishioners. And then I went into discernment for the diaconate and realized I wasn't called to ordination, but still went to CDSP, as the bishop said. And now at 64, a year away from Medicare, I'm dedicating the rest of my life to doing church work because it's the most gratifying work I've ever done in my entire life. And I've done, I've run sales teams. I've done turnarounds for major companies and it never felt as good as this does. So that's my personal story. Um, sometimes I get, a, my voice cracks a lot and I get a little teary eyed, but I kept, I kept it together for you guys, but grateful to be here. Now, is anybody willing to share um, maybe their experience of a faith community that, that had a significant impact in their life? and change the way they viewed the world and themselves and their experience of God. Uh -oh. Think for hands. <laughs> See, this is where being in proximity really helps. Yeah. Yeah, but it's okay. So, all right, I'm going to move on a little bit. All right, now I'm going to move on. Here we go. So when we look at the transformational approach, you know, our primary concern is to, to shift the traditional mindset and practice of stewardship from these transactional requests for money, these uncomfortable requests for money to deeper, more ex meaningful experiences of giving. There are stories in there and everyone has a unique story. And I'm not talking about getting 12 people together at somebody's home and having dinner. And then everybody tells their favorite story about the parish. And it's, it's much deeper than that, right? Based on the reflection. And it's a giving that expands every existing or even potential constituents understanding of stewardship as this series or opportunities for enriching personal and transformational conversations to occur. And a lot of times you hear in the public sphere, you know, the why, what's your why? Um, in our case, we're interested in understanding the why that kind of undergirds or underpins every person's call to be in a relationship with the faith community in the first place. I mean, why are you Episcopalian? Why this particular community? And how does a person's experience of faith impact their lives as made manifest in their experience of God, right? I've said this several times now, the relationship with themselves, with others in the world. And how does your ministry nurture that experience? If I were to say, what's the money question? The money question is, how does your parish, your campus ministry, your school, your camp and conference center nurture someone's experience of their faith? And here's another piece. When I did capital campaigns for the Episcopal Church Foundation, 
we were always focused in phase one discernment, which was communal discernment. But I've always contended that individual discernment enriches communal discernment because individual discernment, as I've laid out here, um, provides a sense of conviction, maybe a higher um, sense of conviction. And ultimately it supports communal discernment more sustainable communal discernment and activity in ministry, participation in ministry. So in this transformational approach, we're looking to breed connections, right? Um, we never assume why someone comes to us, why they sit in a pew. We seek to engage in intentional conversations, right? Casual conversations are okay too. We don't have to be serious all the time, but in this case, to really understand that why. And we're always concerned about the needs of constituents. In other words, you're important to me. I want to know more about you. They're interpersonal and personal. They're interpersonal between people, personal in terms of it's about you, not me. The goal is to make meaningful connections between faith and the impact of faith. Inherently, we're asking people to discern, right? And to reflect. And as I said in the opening, there is a, a formative component to this. Mutually informative because our, our faith communities learn what's important to those we serve and then can respond accordingly. And then we rely on shared experience to create deeper experiences of fellowship. So from a relational stewardship standpoint, we seek to create a space for constituents to reflect upon how your institution nurtures those experiences. When we talk about capacity building and advocacy building, it's really about inspiring appreciation and enthusiasm and giving from gratitude. And so our task is to give people an opportunity, multiple opportunities, because it just doesn't happen during annual giving, it should happen throughout the year. Think of an open door policy, right? To allow those connections to happen. And our goal is always to get all parties involved, right? Into a new way of thinking and an entirely different way of being with respect to stewardship. Right? And if we do that, that transformational component will just provide or imbue a, a formative change in who we are as people. All right. So just really quick as a summary before we get into some theology, um, these oaths of relational stewardship, as I call it, is inherently missional. It embodies soul care and creation care. It's expressed through the quality of our relationships. It's adv advocacy building. It's a ministry of connection. It's a ministry of knowing about the other. Okay. So no, you, I'm sorry, you've got a question. Can oh, you take it? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great, great. First Mary, one. you can unmute. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm from Trinity Church in Milford. Okay. If if we're going to if our goal is to build relationships and yeah. to have intentional conversations, I feel like that goes a little bit deeper than some coffee hours can go. Um, and there's not a whole lot of time to talk during the service. Although Rich will tell you at Trinity, we kind of have a long time handshaking and hugging in the, in the aisles. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, my experience has been having small groups where we have time to dig deeper and dive into, you know, maybe a small six week group that you're meeting with 15 people. Yep. And my question is, can we expect that we're going to be able to engage with different kinds of people with one activity or should we have multiple activities to reach out to many different people? Um, yes, on both counts. So I, I, I like your thinking, your train of thought. So Mary, um, there's, there's a number of ways to do this. Um, first of all, the caveat is um, this is a philosophy and an approach, but to make it be effective, it needs to be nuanced to, to particular circumstances and character of a faith community slash parish, right? So it helps to know 
what you guys are already doing, what you're doing for formation, things of that nature, what you've done in the past. Um, and then we can kind of craft something that makes sense. So um, I've been in situations where I'll give an example coming out. I'll give you a couple examples um, coming out of the pandemic. When I was at St. Michael's, I asked our clergy, uh, we were in the habit of uh, our stewardship committee would get together. We talk among ourselves and kind of draft an outline of what we thought we needed to do. Then we call in clergy about four weeks later and lift that up and say, what do you think about this? We need your feedback, right? So we wanted to do all the heavy lifting. After the pandemic, our clergy said, we need fellowship and we need healing. So we decided to have what we called Emmaus gatherings, right? Not a novel name, but it was appropriate at the time where we'd literally make a meal on Sundays um, or throughout the week. And then we would invite parishioners to participate to talk about number one, their experience of the pandemic, good, bad, and ugly. Number two, how that might have affected their spiritual lives. And number three, how we as a congregation support one another's spiritual lives so that we were invested in one another's spiritual journeys. And post pandemic, we're still at about 230. Um, so we're down quite a bit, about two thirds of what we were, but we had 160 people participate in those small group meetings, which were on average 90 minutes with an option to go longer. We had a meal first for 20 minutes to be in fellowship. And then about an hour, hour and 10 or 15, if people were really pretty feisty, um, to go longer and, um, 160 out of about 220, 230 people participated over an eight week period. And, um, and so that, and from that, we're able to glean a lot of interesting information about what people were doing during the pandemic to stay connected, but also to stay connected in faith. There was a lot of innovation going on, which then we were able to capture and kind of incorporate in, in um, moving forward. Now, in another situation, um, I'm doing some work right now in Cincinnati and what we've done is we're going to, it's, it's Christ Church Cathedral in Cincinnati. And so we're rolling out these small one, we're gonna do one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one and small, and small group meetings because in their case, there are some folks that we need to connect with like one-on-one -on -one or couples two-on-one um, and ask similar types of questions. Um, these are folks that have been around 30 or 40 years and you know what happens in a parish is things change. Sometimes people get a little unnerved and so they need a little extra um, special attention. Well, I don't think that ever happens. I know. And then they're an anomaly. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but I felt compelled to, to share that. But um, but then we'll have small groups with other parishioners. Now, we only want to meet with and we've we've identified constituent groups within the cathedral. So they're by service because there's three services are quite different. Right. Even in age. Um, and then um and then a few other areas in terms of ministry. But we're only going to meet with maybe, I would guess, over annual giving, because they don't really only do that for about five weeks with about 40 people, because it's going to be year round. So it'll be woven into the fabric of that community. And so we'll report out on that to the congregation, probably at the annual meeting, and then invite people to be in constant dialogue. Now that might look like a book group. It might look like a formation event or series, and it might just stand alone as small groups. But as we continue to move forward in that, we'll become clearer about what the needs of the congregation are, and then we'll nuance what we're doing to meet those needs. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. And then there's all sorts of things you can do to wrap that around. I just wrote nine prayerful uh, devotionals on the stewardship theology that I'm starting to share with you in the slide deck to match the lectionary for um, the last night. We're uh, starting from last week through the in-gathering for the cathedral, but I've done videos and all sorts of things. So if, we, if, we, if you guys are intrigued by this and we wanna do a round two, that will be the practical implementation and I can show you a lot of samples of things that I've done and collaborated with that might give you some insights. Is that helpful? Okay, good. So, Joe, I know you want to move on. I just want to flag one thing, if I might. It's Rich sure. Simpson here. Just what Mary said at the beginning, and I and everything. Your answer was, I think, wonderful. 
we can't do this just at coffee hour and at the piece, right? That's where she, right. I mean, there, it has to, there has to be intentionality and a creation of space. And for this kind of transact, for this kind of transformational theology, I think. And I think sometimes people think, oh, I'll just show up on Sunday and that's it. That's not where transformation always happens. So sometimes the colic for purity transforms lives, but um, but also we need, I think, to be able to engage outside of the building. That exactly. Just a comment, really. No, thank you for that. I appreciate it, Rich. And um, and uh, the intentionality is important. And the questions really depend on the constituent group. So, um, yeah, and uh, and I, I won't sidetrack us with um, some options on that. So let me just look, let's look at some of the theology here that grounds us a little bit. So this is from the Reverends um, Thomas Carson and Ronald Reed. They wrote a book on year-round stewardship planning back in the 70s. Um, and they were with the National Church, as we called it. So our vocation to be stewards is at the very heart of the biblical revelation, which acknowledges God as the gracious giver of all things. And our task as the church is to become fully what God has already made us to be, namely givers like God, right? It used to be him, but I made it God. So, and this is one of the most profound truths about ourselves. Now, um, Joe Britton was my former rector. He used to be the dean at uh, the Berkeley School at Yale Divinity. And uh, we used to work pretty closely together. And so um, Joe and I used to talk about this all the time and, and, he crafted a letter one time and he said, our call to stewardship is expressed in the care of the soul of the other in those living things with whom we share this planet and the precious resources we have been given that sustain and inspire us. The first part is soul care. The next two are creation care. And then Richard Cunningham was Baptist theologian, still alive, living in Fort Collins at 92. And now he references the great commandment. A shortened version of it here is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if the central purpose of creation and redemption is person making and personal relationships, then nothing is more important in Christian stewardship than what happens in our personal relationships. Persons are the richest resource of our lives. He goes on to talk about our responsibility as most intense in social groups in which we have sustained relationships, face-to-face -face contact, and common interests. These groups may take shape at work and social life in the neighborhood and certainly in the church. In the neighborhood makes sense when we want to do outreach through ministry. These same type of conversations could be had with those we serve in the community, right? In these close relationships, we learn how to open ourselves to others, to love and serve our neighbors, to forgive and be forgiven, to be helped or to help and be helped. Okay. And then lastly, there is a mutual ministry within the church that facilitates the growth of people towards personal and spiritual maturity that enables their ministry in the world. So the missional uh, theology piece is how do we as people of faith discern God call in our, or in our lives? How do we use our God-given gifts to live into our call? Where, uh, where and in what context are we called to do God's work? In other words, how might I serve my faith community? Or how might I serve the world? And how do our commitments enable us to imitate Christ? This is an ongoing question that I think serves all of us. And this is... This helps with sustainable mission, uh, I'm sorry, ministry, but it also helps in infusing new people into ministry. How many times have you tried to get people in your church to, you needed volunteers for godly play or for the food pantry, you know, or to be altar servers or to be ushers. And you ask two or three times and it's exasperating. <laughs> and the same 20 or 30 people are always involved in multiple ministries depending on the size of your congregation. So I think this is a valuable way of engaging people in conversation. This is truly a formative event that could be a series. And then from a pastoral standpoint, I'll quote Maria Harris. Um, the pastoral vocation is a call to a particular way of living, which implies the caring for and practical engagement of persons in the work of Christian ministry. And we are called to care ourselves, for one another, to take seriously our relation to God and all God's creatures, both within and beyond the church. You can see some redundancy here. And we are called to end our isolation from others by living each day of our lives rooted in love, rooted in Christ. 
and we are called to believe that in doing so, we fulfill our destiny as people of God. All right. And then from William uh, Klebisch and Charles Jekyll, the ministry of pastoral care consists of helping acts done by Christian persons directed toward the healing, sustaining, guiding, and reconciling of troubled persons whose troubles arise in the context of their ultimate meanings and concerns. Think of motivations and needs, desires, challenges, roadblocks. Pastoral care calls forth questions and issues at a depth where the meaning of life and faith is involved on the part of the helper as well as the part of the one being helped. So um, I don't think you can end one of these without quoting Henry Nowen um, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I think that's some ECF legacy, um, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Nowen, living a spiritual life requires a change of heart or mindset. And whether we are asking for money or giving money, we are drawn together by God, who is about to do a new thing through our collaboration. To be converted means to experience a deep shift in how we think and act.